I'm going to start my comments and end my comments tonight with a fox. Long, long ago, in a time that's so distant it's almost beyond memory, in the northern forest of what we now call Canada, there was a hunter-gatherer village. And in that village there was a cabin, and in that cabin there was a little girl who was sick. She was so sick that her parents put her by the fire to keep her warm and put blankets on top. But every day she got worse and worse and the light began to leave her eyes. She had trouble breathing. Her breath was coming like this. And so they sent for the old woman, the old healer woman of the village. She came into the cabin and hobbled over to the bed where the girl lay. Her name was Duck Egg. Duck Egg looked down at the girl and then she leaned down and listened to her breathing. <laughs> And then Duck Egg stood up and said, I hear the sound of a little she-fox. The fox is traveling through the winter snow outside. The she-fox is weak and hungry and has a long journey to go. We have to help the little she-fox, old Duck Egg said. The girl's father was a hunter. He came over and said, Duck Egg, I will go and help the fox. Duck Egg said, yes, go find the fox and bring her to me. And so the hunter got on his heavy winter coats and opened the door. And as he opened the door, the swirling snow outside came in with a thousand little crystals. He stepped outside, closed the door, got his snowshoes on and walked across the clearing and disappeared into the forest. He walked a long time looking for a trail and finally found the trail of the fox. He followed it all day and finally he saw the fox ahead in the snow. She was weak but she was afraid of the hunter, so she kept on going. Back in the cabin, Duck Egg leaned over and listened to the girl's chest. And she stood up and said, I hear the sound of the little she-fox. Every step she takes, she's breaking through the crust of the snow. That's what I hear. Cha, cha, cha. I hear the sound of the fox breaking through the snow. And I hear the sound shh, 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 of the hunter's snowshoes. He's seen the fox. The hunter continued following the fox, but he couldn't catch her. And finally darkness came. He had to stop and build a fire. He built the fire, and in the darkness, he saw two lights looking in at him. It was the fox nearby at the edge of darkness looking in. Back in the cabin, Duck Egg was listening to the girl breathing. And she stood up and said, I hear the crackling of a fire. The hunter has stopped for the night and has made a fire. The fox 
is watching. The girl will be hot. The girl will have a fever tonight. The fire, the hunter kept the fire going all night because it was so cold. It was such a winter storm that if he stopped, he would have died. He stayed awake all night. And when the light came, the fox was gone. He put his snowshoes on and continued to follow the trail of the fox. After some hours, he saw the fox ahead, and now the fox was very weak, and he was able to catch up to it. He reached down, grabbed the fox, and pulled the fox back into his arms. He could feel the beating of the fox's heart. It was weak. The fox turned to him and said, why have you followed me? Kill me. Kill me now. And the hunter said, I'm not going to kill you, little fox. A little girl needs you. And he carried her all that day and that night back to the cabin. And as he walked back to the cabin, old duck egg was listening to the girl <gasps> breathing. And she stood up and said, the hunter has found the fox. I hear the beating of the fox's heart. It's very fast. The little fox, the little she fox is afraid, but he's bringing the fox back. Finally, after a day and a half, the hunter opened the door of the cabin and stepped in with a bundle of fur that was limp. Old duck egg said, bring the fox to me. He carried the fox over to old duck egg who put it on the bed next to the girl and said, bring meat. I need some meat for the fox. The mother brought meat over, put it down near the fox. The fox rallied and began to eat the meat and it ate all of it. And old duck egg said, bring more meat, and the fox ate more, and then the fox went to sleep. Some hours passed. Everything was quiet, like it is now. And then the fox opened its eyes, and the little girl opened her eyes at the same time. Old Duck Egg said, open the door of the cabin. The hunter went over and opened the door. The fox lifted its head up, sniffed the air, jumped down from the bed. And as the fox jumped down from the bed, the girl seemed stronger. Old Duck Egg held her up so she could sit up. She watched as the, as the fox trotted over to the door and went out into the snow. The storm had passed. It was a white world, but the storm had passed. The fox began to trot across the clearing. As the fox trotted across the clearing, the little girl got up out of the bed and walked over to the door. The fox disappeared into the forest. The girl watched it go. And then old duck egg turned to the mother and father and said, tell me this, did the fox cure the girl or did the girl cure the fox? The mother and father thought for a minute, and then the mother answered and said, they cured each other. And then old duck egg, nobody knew how old she was. She spent so many times of her life outdoors. Old duck egg began to laugh, and as she laughed, the wrinkles spread across her face like the ripples spreading across Lake Michigan. The curing fox, reconnecting 
with the digital world. My friends, 15,000 years ago, this story, which is a story from the Cree nation north of here, this story would have been told in cultures around the world. It might have had different details, but this is a story that your ancestors and mine told because 15,000 years ago, all of our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. What we're going to do in the next part of the program is find out who we are. We're going to bring back through the mists of time the hunter-gatherers of the past. They're still here in the room. 10,000 years ago, we developed agriculture, we developed cities and towns, and we began to leave the hunting-gathering life behind. And so today we live a modern life increasingly cut off from nature, from trees and animals and the world that our ancestors knew so well. But I believe, I believe that we are still those people. I believe we have a biological, physical, emotional, spiritual need to be connected with the outdoors, with nature, with the natural world, whatever you want to call it. We have in one sense become as domesticated as our animals, but in another sense, we are still desperately needing to be in contact with nature. Kids and adults, no matter what the age. Nature keeps us healthy. It enables us to become fully functioning human beings. There are two qualities of nature that stimulate us and challenge us. This is a picture of my son who's on the right doing something stupid. <laughs> Did you ever do that when you're growing up? A lot of guys have that experience doing something stupid that you manage to live, fortunately. But anyway, somebody happened to be taking a picture. Two things about nature that challenge us and stimulate us. First of all, nature is dynamic. When you're outdoors on that Lake Michigan, there's no guarantees. Nature is dynamic, constantly changing in unexpected, surprising ways that are often unpredictable, and because of that, it arouses all of our senses. You gotta be ready. Secondly, another property of nature that stimulates us and challenges us. It's in the natural world that we meet those other beings which are like us, but different than us. Dogs can dance. Maybe so. This is my son's uh, golden retriever. We live in the so-called information age. But there's a lot of information that's already in our DNA. And it was passed to us by our ancestors, by these hunter-gatherer people. The only reason you're here today is because of them. They were successful at what they did. And that information lives on inside your DNA. Because the world that was new to you when you were born is old to our species. So studies show, for example, that young chimpanzees can recognize not only that, but they are afraid of snakes even though they've never met one before. Somehow, that response to be afraid of a snake is coded into the chimpanzee DNA because the ancestors knew it was smart to be afraid. Now, you may say that's chimpanzees, but studies have been done of people like you and me, and if you put a subliminal photo into a movie, 
of a snake. You know, it's in there so quick that you can't visually see it, but it changes the heart rate of the person. So we're not any different than the chimpanzees. A photo of a snake will make a person afraid. You can embed a subliminal photo of a gun or a car, and it won't do anything because those are so new that our DNA doesn't recognize us to be afraid of those. That knowledge has yet to be passed on to the ancestors, to the descendants, I should say. There's a revolution going on in genetics. It's called epigenetics. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. When I was taught high school biology, I was taught all the information that makes me who I am is in the chromosomes. It's in the genes. And it doesn't get changed except by the occasional mutation. Turns out that's not right. There's a new science called epigenetics. Epidermis is something that's on the surface, right? So epigenetic, epigenetics is what's on the surface. It turns out that our chromosomes are covered with a layer of proteins and they carry information. Not only that, but that epigenetic material, that epigenetic protein is changed by what you experience and we know it gets passed on at least two generations. So if you become an alcoholic, or if you become a couch potato, or if you spend a lot of time in nature, it not only makes you healthy or less healthy, it actually changes the epigenetic material. And that change gets passed on to your kids and your grandkids, and maybe beyond. But we know at least to kids and grandkids. So what you do matters. What we say, you know, we say, um, you are what you eat. Turns out it's true. So if we spend our time out in nature, it actually is a good thing. It models for other people maybe some valuable things to do. About 14,000 years ago, there was an idea that somebody tried, they took a wolf and tried to domesticate it. And they created this thing called the dog. We think it was around 14,000 years ago. Maybe wrong, maybe a little bit less, a little bit longer. This is a, my daughter-in-law with a young puppy um, that now is a grown dog. It's probably no accident that she has this dog because when I was growing up, I had dogs. And when my sons were growing up, they had dogs. And now, it, their sons are growing up, they're going to have dogs. And that's been happening for 14,000 years. So we do have a chance to change things by what we model. Today, our modeling increasingly separates us from nature we are encouraging a belief that we can be separate from nature. So for example, by 2030, 15 years from now, the expectation according to demographics is three quarters of the people on this planet will be living in urban areas. Three quarters. So you don't have a lot of contact with the natural world. It's a school playground. Free play. Free play activities are where kids play in unstructured spaces like a woods or a meadow. This is a structured place. This is, was created by people. Free play activities continue to decline. We increasingly take kids to places that are man-created environments where all the hazards have been removed and all the variation has been removed. The only tracks you would see here are what you see on the pavement. There's no fox tracks there. The home range of a child has declined by 90%. When I was a kid, and I think when many of you were kids, we roamed. Now kids don't roam. Their roaming areas decline by 90%. A typical child spends 90% of their day indoors. I'm wondering how much time you spend indoors. Take a week and clock it and see. 
Is it 90%, 80%, 95%? In schools, we are testing kids to death. And the kids know what they need. They want to be outdoors like this kid on the right. Looks good to me. Look at little kids, your grandchildren, your children, whatever. They want to be outdoors. They want to be doing unstructured things. Today's schools prepare kids for sitting in chairs. The cultural message is that whatever is valuable is happening indoors. Whatever's happening outdoors, that kind of doesn't count. We're becoming addicted to vicarious experiences, and that's where I would say we're courting an extinction of real experience. You can do it all on the computer. You can't. It's just a tool. So here's the core of the program coming up. I believe there are six elements of the human nature that have been passed to us by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. We're still those people. There's a scientist named Richard Dawkins who has a theory named ecological anachronism. You know what an anachronism is. It's something that's still here, but it, it's designed for the past, like a Model T. You know, that'd be an anachronism today. Well. Richard Dawkins says, if you look at a human being or an oak tree out there or a fish in Lake Michigan, those are ecological anachronisms because you weren't designed for today. You were designed for 10, 20, 50,000 years ago. The modern environments are not conducive to your health. You were designed to live a life outdoors. And he says that because evolution takes a while to happen. You know, it takes 20 years for a human being to have a generation. A bacteria, no problem, 20 minutes. But because it takes us 20 years, it takes a long time to really change the human being. So we're anachronisms. We're designed for the past, not for today. And so, who are we? Who are these hunter-gatherer people who we still are? Well, they were designed to live outdoors and they were designed to have relationships, to live in a community. That's what's so wonderful about being here in South Haven. I get a sense that, you know, at least in this room tonight, there's a real community that you've come together to do something powerful for the community. That's who we always were. Those people who were your ancestors, they knew that they needed relationships with the greater community not just the people in the tribe around you, but the trees, the rivers, the animals, the sky. It's my son uh, in Montana in the uh, Bitterroot Mountains. 15,000 years ago, if you were cast out by the tribe, you were dead. It was impossible to survive on your own. And you knew that. Inside, you knew that. It was a death sentence. And so today, if you want to drive somebody insane, put them in solitary confinement in a prison. It'll do it. Because we need connection with other people. We need connection with other things. If you're going to deprive people of contact with people, at least give them a dog or a pet or something so they can connect with another living thing. Because we're still those people. We know inside we need relationships to survive. Picture if you came into this room tonight and you didn't know a single other person, and we all were speaking a language you didn't understand. Think about how you would feel. They're all dressed differently. You don't know anybody, and they speak a different language. You would say, hmm, I think I'm in the wrong room. I don't belong here. These are not my people. Because you have no relationships. That's dangerous. You, your hunter-gatherer self knows you need that. There were no strangers 15,000 years ago. This is a painting uh, from the Ojibwe people on uh, Manitoulin Island, Lake Huron. 
um, of their sense of life, their sense 15,000 years ago is we're part of a community, but that community extends into the earth. It's a living earth. We're all alive together. The rock, the soil, the trees, the birds. People had relationships with all those things. That's why I believe today, when you get into an elevator, are you uncomfortable in an elevator with those other people? I am. I'm tremendously uncomfortable. And I imagine everybody else standing around me is. You know why? Because we're still those hunter-gatherer people. Can you imagine back then walking into an elevator? I mean, I know it's absurd, but think about it. Nobody back then would walk into a crowded space with absolute strangers. Are you nuts? And worse than that, you're going to walk into a crowded space with strangers and not acknowledge their presence by not speaking to them, not recognizing them. By not recognizing them, you're saying to them, I don't care about you. You don't matter. You don't mean anything to me. Well, guess what? You don't mean anything to them. That's dangerous. So in an elevator, we're not operating the way our inside tells us we should operate because we're still those people we're designed to know and have relationships with the people around us, the trees around us, the water and the air and so on. You're meant to have conversations with these people and these other beings. My wife was a reading recovery teacher until she re recently retired. And one of the things I took away from her was one of the high priestesses of reading recovery, a, a researcher named Carol Lyons, who said, conversations are the basis of all knowledge. Conversations, they're that important. They're the basis of all knowledge. This is from Carol after all her years of brain research. I think she's right because I spend most of my day having a conversation with myself. Do you have an inner voice that you talk to all day long? I mean, me and me are always having a conversation. I can't, like, think without a conversation in my head. There's always this thing going on during the day. We are conversational people. We need to talk with other people. And our hunter-gatherer ancestors talked with many of the parts of nature. takes two people to have a conversation, right? Takes a speaker and a listener. This is another painting from the Ojibwe people in Manitoulin Island and Lake Huron. In Ojibwe creation stories, there was a hero. His name was Nanabojo. He was kind of a trickster figure. He was half man, half god. And he was sent to the earth by the creator to prepare it for the people who would come. I mean, the plants and the animals and the water, they were already here. People were the last to come. And the creator sent Nana Bojo first to create it, get things ready, so he could teach the people later. The creator told Nana Bojo, when you get there, Nana Bojo, watch and listen to everything. Listen to the animals. Listen to the plants, listen to the rivers, listen to the sky, listen to the rocks. Learn how they live. Learn their stories. Learn their songs. And then, only then, give them their names. Notice what the Creator said. Listen. First, use personal discovery, and then you can have a conversation. There's a story about a PhD botanist who went to the Amazon. He wanted to see a whole lot of the um, plants in the Amazon, and he hired a, a local guide to take him around because the guide knew all the plants. And when the Days rolled by and the 
researcher was just being, you know, I, I need to see this. The guide would take it, show him that plant. I need to see that. He'd take him, show him that plant. The researcher was so impressed. This PhD said, Juan, how, how is it possible? Your knowledge, it's so good. And the guy just shook his head kind of sadly and said, yes, I know their names, but I wish I knew their songs. Because if you really want to get to know a person or a plant or animal, the name is just the beginning. If I know his name, that's only the very beginning. I have to know his story, where he came from, what his hopes were, what his dreams were and still are. I have to know his song. And then there's the beginning of a deep relationship. Our first relationship when we came into this world was with our mother. We listened first before we spoke. We listened to her heartbeat. We listened to her voice. Studies have shown very clearly that the baby that's in the womb can distinguish the mother's voice from other voices. The fetus is listening first. Maybe the reason why we find drums and drum beats so hypnotic is because we spent those nine months listening to the beat of the mother's heart. Like Nana Bojo, the baby listens first. As we grow, we become intensely social animals. We spend most of our day trying to figure out what's in other people's minds. You'll go home tonight and try to figure out what's in your husband's mind or your wife's mind. You'll spend the whole day tomorrow. I'm still trying to figure out what's in Trump's mind, and <laughs> if anything. Sorry, I had to put that in there. <laughs> but no, really, we spend our whole day trying to find. So that's an intensely social animal. We become embedded in a social network. We learn from each other. We cooperate with each other. We compare ourselves to other people in our social network. We compete with each other. And we watch what people do because we think maybe we should do that. Maybe that's the way to understand the world. And when we get cut off from our social network, we get lonely. We feel disconnected. And we give that name loneliness to describe the emotion, but an evolutionary biologist would tell you that that feeling of loneliness is there. It's like a drumbeat telling you, get connected, get connected, because it's so dangerous as a hunter-gatherer not to be connected. So loneliness is a survival mechanism. Get connected. It's dangerous not to be connected. Studies show that you influence not only your friends, but your friends' friends, and your friends' friends' friends. Three degrees of influence. And by the way, it works the other way. Your friends, friends, friends influence you. So what you do matters. If you take care of people, take care of animals, if you take care of the environment, you're influencing not just your friends, but your friends, friends, friends. That's a lot of people. As Gandhi said, you must become the change you want to see. When we provide children, our grandchildren, our neighbor's children, anybody's children, with experiences and relationships with natures, we plant seeds in their social network that extends at least three degrees of influence. We need relationships. 
with nature, with each other. Second thing I think that the hunter-gatherers, your ancestors have left you, is a deep need and sense for this place called home, this place here called South Haven, but wherever, this place called home. Our first home, it's an ultrasound of my granddaughter, our first home was in our mother's womb. It was a great place. Central heating, free drinks, all you could eat. And then we came out into this more complicated world beyond, wow. All animals and plants develop a home territory. On National Public Radio just recently, they talked about the goby fish. I found this fascinating. Goby is one of the ones that people buy uh, um, for you know, an aquarium fish. But they, there's many species, and they live in the intertidal zone between high tide and low tide. And if you're on a rocky coast and you're a goby fish, a lot of times you get caught in a rocky pool, and it may, there may be an octopus in there, too, that wants to eat you. So you've got to get out of there. Goby fish are hard to keep because if you don't keep a screen on top, they jump out. Because they're used to jumping out of those pools to get away from something. Well, they did a study on the goby fish, and they found that the goby fish during the time that high tide floods the area, they're swimming around and they're making a mental map of the area of this place called home. And when the tide goes out, they know where they can jump. Because you're not going to jump into just dry land and die there. So they jump into where they know there's a pool. They've got it all memorized. That's problem solving. That's learning. That comes from a recent book uh, called What a Fish Knows. It was talked about on National Public Radio. So all animals develop a sense of home, and they develop a deep relationship with it. It's a place where you can read the signs, read the symbols. I'm pretty good at reading the signs and symbols in a place like South Haven. I do terrible in the inner city area. I don't read the signs well at all. They develop a mental map. At the end of each day, you need to come home to the security of home. I told Rosie, Rosie Thurber is uh, very generously letting me stay at her place this week. I told her I slept very badly last night. And Rosie, it's not your fault. It's not because the bed is, is, is bad. It's a wonderful place. But there was another study that I just heard about recently, and it just explained it. You know, when you go away and you sleep somewhere else and, and, and you say, it must be the bed. You know, it's nothing like going home to my bed. Well, it turns out it's not the bed. Well, probably, you know, I've slept in some pretty bad beds, and you have too. But, but it's, a lot of it is because of not having that place called home, because your brain needs to shut down and, you know, file all the experiences away. If you don't let somebody sleep for four or five days, you can literally kill them. Um, so, you know, we know we need sleep, but it turns out from the studies that if you sleep at home, your whole brain shuts down. If you're sleeping like I am in South Haven, which is not my home, I can make it my home given enough time here, but right now it's not my home. Only half your brain sleeps and the other half stays awake. That makes sense as a hunter-gatherer, right? Like, you better have half a brain awake if you're sleeping away from home where the tribe has some sense of security. So we still do that. Half your brain stays awake if you're in Europe or if you're in Minnesota or wherever. And it's not as restful a sleep. So thank you, Rosie, but it's not your fault. Remember the um, TV sitcom from the 1980s about the Cheers bar where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came? You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. That's what a community is about. That's why home feels so good. And it works the other way. Like, if I don't learn his name or her name and his, her song and her story, we can't have a relationship and I can't have a sense of home. Because I want to be known, but they need to be known too. 
A love of nature begins when people develop a relationship with a place. When kids grow up, that place where they spend time, the Calhaven Trail or Lake Michigan, it becomes a filter, a gauze through which you see the world. It stays with you your whole life, just like I'm sure the experiences you had with nature as a kid stay with you your whole life. Every night we go home, hopefully, and at the end of our lives, I know I was there when my father died. I can tell you, he was home. I know it. He was talking to his mother. I can say that that's just whatever, but at least in his mind, that's where he went at the end. Children learn about home by measuring trees and lakes and forests and animals against their own bodies by interacting with those materials of home. We carry mental maps in our head about home. You know, when your parents raised you, they took you all kinds of places in the car, but you never really knew where those places were until you got behind the wheel and drove the car yourself. So it's an active kind of thing, exploring. That's how you develop a sense of home, sense of South Haven in Michigan and the world. The world is made up of a mosaic of little worlds. When you're a kid, it starts out exploring those little places. Kids like little refuges that they can have, little nests, and then they expand out from that. The third thing that I think is deeply coded in our genetic legacy from the past, we need to interact with animals. We need to interact with the other beings that are out there besides people. Animal fascination can be seen by the fact that infants visually process and categorize animals faster than they do inanimate objects. It can be seen by the fact that people, when shown a scene with animals in it, can find the animals in a fraction of a second. 90% of the characters in children's stories are animals. What do people hang over the crib, typically? Animals. We have always been fascinated by animals and seen parallels in them with people. It served our ancestors well to be fascinated by animals. We ate them, they ate us, and they showed us where the food was. And they cooperated with us like the dogs to find it, or the wolves. Linguists, people who study language, believe that much of our earliest language was used to describe animals and their movements and their behavior. I know when my first grandson was born, the two things that, the two words that he first could say were dog and ball, because both of them move and they seemed to him like they were alive. How many of you have a dog at home? Raise your hands if you have a dog at home. Quite a few. How about a cat? Any cats in the room? So I said about 14,000 years ago, people domesticated dogs. Uh, this is my son's dog uh, in Montana. Today, there's a dog for every four persons in the United States. And cats, which were domesticated perhaps around 10,000 years ago, are the most um, popular pet in the world. We bond with dogs and cats because, at least in this respect, they're less complicated than human relationships. People are always like going south on you, you know, like, I like you now, but I don't like you because of that. Whereas the dogs and the cats, they pretty much are just, you know, it's an uncomplicated relationship. And just to prove that to you, here's a little trick you can try if you want to. If you have a dog and you have a spouse, um, and you have a car with a trunk in it still, accidentally lock the dog and your spouse in the car, <laughs> drive around the block, open the trunk, and see which one is glad to see you. <laughs> I 
a less complicated relationship. The most often cited reason for having a pet is companionship and affection. If you ask people why they have a pet, companionship and affection. Dogs are animals, we say. We should really think about that word animal because it comes from the word anima, which means soul. So you see that thing right there? It has a soul. At least that's what our hunter-gatherer ancestors believed. They believed that all those things out there that moved had a soul. That's why they're animals, they're anima, they're the beings with spirits like us. And if you have a dog or a cat, you probably believe, you probably feel that it's a member of the family, it's kin. And kinship always implied responsibility. If he and I are kin, if you and I are kin, that implies some responsibility on my part and his part or her part. And our hunter-gatherers believed that the animals were kin. And you be kind to kin. Those two words are closely related. Kind and kin. You be kind to kin. The potential for Compassion, that's what we're talking about in a way. The potential for compassion appears to be hardwired in people. We have that potential. All human beings appear to have the potential to be compassionate, but the trick is to get it going. It's almost like wood that needs a spark to ignite it, and studies have shown that animals provide that spark. So if in our community, we think compassion is a good thing. How do we get it going? Apparently one way is to have relationships with these other beings called animals, the things with souls. Some studies have shown that experiences with animals early in life lead to greater empathy. In a European study, they showed that having a childhood pet produced children who later on were more willing to sacrifice for others or for the environment, compassion. Other studies showed that petting an animal, like a dog or a cat, not only lowers stress hormones in people, it's good for your health, it lowers the stress hormones in the animal, the dog or the cat. Did the fox cure the girl, or did the girl cure the fox? Pet owners, we know, have less visits to doctors, less prescription use. Companion animals speed healing, speed recovery, and dog owners are more physically active, not only as teenagers, but later on as adults. A study of ADHD boys showed positive impacts by having a companion animal. The ADHD boys had better speech, better attention, better school performance, better social life, more empathy, less impulsivity, less disruptive behavior. We need relationships with these other beings. It's who we are. In other words, it may be better to rub the belly of an animal than the belly of a smartphone. I do both, I admit it. It's not just animals, of course. Plants, gardening make us feel better. Trees make us feel better. Surely the reason we bring green plants into the places where we live is because we still feel that connection, that need to be close to green plants. It's a memory of a time when trees sheltered us, gave us medicine, kept us warm. People of all ages still find joy in gardening and connecting with plants and animals. This is a picture of two girls from the Netherlands who were visiting us. And I was introducing the story of the monarch butterfly to them. That's a monarch butterfly there in the garden. Um, 
we have an ancient spiritual connection with monarch butterflies across the world, across cultures, across time. I was saying to somebody tonight that in ancient Greece, there was this word called psyche, and it meant two things at the same time, depending on how you used it. It could mean the inner spirit, the mind, the soul, and so we call it psychology today, but it could also mean butterfly, because we thought that butterflies were spiritual. And we still do. People release them at weddings and funerals. We're still those people. As Shakespeare said one time, this, our life, finds tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. The fourth thing, I think, that is a legacy from our ancestors that we desperately need. We need the arts. And by that I mean all creative expression, anything that expresses human creativity. That's who our people were and that's who we still are today. Every culture in the world expresses creativity through a range of the arts. And I don't just mean painting or music or dance. I mean essentially what I'm doing here, a good story being told, a good teacher who knows how to engage an audience. That's art. Our ancestors could not pass on knowledge with books and computers and all that. There was no written language. You had to be a good performer. You had to be a good artist because all the information had to be passed on like I'm doing it now. And if you were good at it, your kids would survive. And if you weren't, they weren't going to survive because they had to learn everything all over again the hard way. So we became creative people expressing creative language. Art, these are some students creating art outdoors on the ground from natural materials. Art is play behavior for the mind. It helps us to imagine new worlds, new possibilities, new ways of doing things, new designs. Every culture past and present has invested a lot of time, energy, and money in the arts. It's that important because as Einstein, who we credit as being a very intelligent person, Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Young children live in their imaginations. They role play. Pablo Picasso once said, Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. This girl is creating art from mud on the side of a tree here. Indigenous cultures like the Ojibwe here in the Great Lakes area, the Ojibwe believed that language itself came from the land. It was a gift of the land. The voice of the land is in our language. And it's true. Think about just a few pieces of language. How do we sing? We sing like birds. And sometimes we're rooted to the spot, like I am here because I have this microphone when I can't move very far. So I'm rooted to the spot. And fortunately, I'm not frozen in fright. I had a couple of kids, but I didn't breed like rabbits. <laughs> Some people are as gentle as lambs. Some people get bogged down in details. Some people drive each other batty. And you are as beautiful as a summer's day. So nature is part of our language, as the Ojibwe believe. It's a gift from the land. All art expresses emotion. Like I'm trying to get some emotion going here tonight, hoping to make you feel things. A good artist uses art to express and evoke emotion. It's contagious. 
When somebody is afraid, we feel it. If I was really nervous up here tonight, you'd feel that. I think I'm not very nervous, and I think you feel that. And when somebody is really happy and joyful, we feel that too. Emotion appears to be more primitive than language. It appears we were emotional before we learned to speak. And of course, we learned to speak before we learned to write. So emotion comes first. It's contagious. We're always ready to feel what somebody else feels, which is why, which is why it's so dangerous, some of the political language that's going on right now, in my mind. But um, as, the po as the poet Maya Angelou once said, I've learned that people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I'm hoping that this presentation not only gets you to think about something tonight, but it makes you feel something. Then I'll believe it was successful. I hope in some ways it might inspire you to spend more time outdoors, or even better yet, to take some other people outdoors, especially some kids. Because I think that's our responsibility. The people who are in the room that are older like me, we cannot leave the stage without passing on our passion, our experience for the outdoors. We have to inspire other people. And I want you to think about that word inspire for a minute. It comes from two words, in spirit. Literally, that's where it comes from, inspire, in spirit. Because there was a time in our past when we believed that that world out there, the lake, the river, the sky, the trees, the animals, was filled with spirit. They all had spirit. They all had soul. And if you could breathe it in, and really feel it, if you had a really good teacher, they would inspire you. You'd bring the spirit of the world into your body. It's really what the word inspire means. We believed the world was filled with spirit, and I still believe it. One of your neighbors from Minnesota, Bob Dylan, said this one time, and I love it. Bob said, the highest purpose of art is to inspire. What else can you do? What else can you do for anyone but inspire them? As a former teacher, I like to say it this way, the highest purpose of teaching is to inspire. What else can a teacher do but inspire somebody? The fifth thing, we need to do is to keep moving. To be alive is to move. All things move. We were designed to move. We were designed to notice movement. In the hunter-gatherer days, if you didn't notice those bushes moving, you were somebody else's dinner. And so today, you still do that because if I stand here like this and never move, you get tired after a while. But if I say, hey, look, you know what? See how we're always looking for movement because we're still those people. Children know they need to keep moving. That's why it's so hard to keep them in chairs in the classroom. They want the room. They know what they need. They need to move. They need to be outside. That's what they want. The thing is about the outdoors is natural spaces are more varied and less controlled. There's a lot of structure there. They're more interesting. The surfaces are uneven. Sure, a kid can fall, but your body was designed to walk on uneven surfaces. If we spend our whole life walking on this floor, we're more prone to fall. Your body needs to be experiencing uneven environments, uneven temperatures, uneven wind, uneven surfaces. That's how it functions best. And that's how natural spaces are. But modern life suggests that evolution is taking us that direction. Studies show that mobility is the best indicator of longevity. You want to live a long life, you want to live a good life, keep moving. That's what the studies show. Mobility is the best 
predictor of longevity. Every hour spent increases the risk of becoming physically disabled. I have deep apologies to you for keeping you sitting this long. <laughs> Studies show that a walk in the countryside, a ride on the Cowhaven Trail, is more restoring than an urban walk with all those man-made noises and things going on. The studies show that. It's more restorative to you physically and mentally to take a walk in uneven natural terrain in a forest where the vapors being given off by the trees are healthy compared to the vapors that are being given off in these man-made environments from the carpets and so on. Finally, the last piece of the legacy from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Human beings are meant to be hunters, meant to be gatherers. Everything that's alive on this planet hunts for something. The trees out there hunt for sunlight and are competing with each other to find the sunlight. They hunt for the minerals and the water and the soil. Everything hunts. Everything gathers what they need for life. Hunting is a metaphor for life. We all hunt. Tell me what you hunt and I will tell you who you are. John Lindstrom, who helped to fix our uh, AV here, John hunts language and words. Some of you hunted mathematics or whatever, but we all hunt something in our lives. Hunting is about relationships. This is uh, artwork from the Huicholi people in Mexico. Successful hunters like the one on the right there of the blue sun in the middle, successful hunters on the right have a relationship with the prey, which I'll say is the one on the left. The hunter is the predator, right? The prey is the thing that gets hunted. You notice the connection between those say predator. The two words are almost the same, but they denote different things. So the predator is the thing that hunts the prey. And the predator, the mountain lion or the wolf on Isle Royal, the predator is successful if he knows the mind of the prey. And the prey is successful if he knows the mind of the predator even better. So there's a relationship there. Hunting and gathering requires detailed knowledge of the place called home. You have to be able to read the signs and symbols, the tracks of this place called home. So we've identified now six elements of things that I think are in you and they're gifts from your ancestors. Relationships, a sense of home, the need to be with other beings, these things called animals and plants the need to move, the need for hunting and gathering, the need for creativity in the arts, to express the creativity that's inside you. Meanwhile, outside, the earth is singing. The longest day has passed. Birds are fledged. Next year's seeds are already prepared. And when nighttime comes, Scorpio, the scorpion, will be rising in the south that has his done for countless thousands of years. So many gifts out there. So much responsibility that you and I have to help other people experience and appreciate the gifts of this world. This place called South Haven, this place called Michigan, this place called North America, this place called home. In closing, I want to give the last word to a son of Massachusetts, a man who was perhaps largely responsible for the modern environmental movement, a man who Ralph Waldo Emerson said knew the area around his home of Concord, Massachusetts, like a fox. That's what Ralph Waldo Emerson said. He knew the area around Concord like a fox. During his time at Walden Pond, Henry David Thoreau wrote these words. 
Rise from care before dawn and seek adventures. Let the noon find you by other lakes and the night overtake you everywhere at home. There are no larger fields than these, no worthier games than may be played. So said the fox, the man who knew not only the names of the animals and some 800 kinds of trees and plants around Concord, 800 kinds of trees and plants, but he also knew their songs. My friends, in the forest, there is a village. And in the village, there is a little girl. And in the little girl, there is a fox. We must think like the fox. We must be the fox. The fox will cure the girl if the girl will cure the fox. Mm -hmm.